welcome to uh, Planet in Nordic's user stories around secret managers in Kubernetes. Joining me today, I have three community members that are going to share their experiences around secret managers in Kubernetes. I'm looking forward a lot to hear what they have to tell you about. So before we get started, I think we should start with a short round of introductions so you have a chance to know who you will listen to before we start up with the presentations. Uh, some ground rules for this session is that if you have any questions, feel free to send them in the chat and we will try to make time after this, each presentation and also at the end of this event. We're aiming to uh, continue doing this somewhere between one o'clock and two uh, o'clock, so around one hour. So joining me today, we have Peter and Hannah and Henrik. Welcome, everyone. Thank you. Hi, thank you. So let's start with a round of introductions. Uh, Peter, would you like to start? Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, my name is Peter. I'm a security engineer at uh, Luna. Luna is a, is a Nordic challenger bank uh, and with, with, with AWS and uh, Kubernetes and uh, stuff like that. Welcome. Hannah, would you like to go next? Yes, uh, my name is Hannah and I work as a platform engineer at Anotel. Welcome. And Henrik. Thank you. Hi, yeah, my name is Henrik Hui. I'm from Denmark. I work at Evicode as a consultant right now. I've worked with Kubernetes since 2015 and a lot of other stuff, yes. I'm so happy to have you here and that thank you so much for being able to join me and share your stories today. So uh, on the agenda today, we're going to have, uh, Peter, you're going to talk about uh, from static to dynamic secrets and uh, share a little bit around that. And after that, Hannah is going to share uh, the experience from working with external secrets. And Henrik, you're going to talk about using Hashcop for, for secret management. And this is like a perfect agenda. I'm looking forward to hear it all. And it feels like uh, a lot has happened recently with secret managers. Starting out with Kubernetes, there was not a lot of tools going around. And if everyone, anyone remember the tech creator coming out from the CNCF uh, end user community not that long ago, they talked about different uh, secret managers as well. And, and show the adoption rate of them. And some of the secret mentions we talk about today was part of that report as well. So I can recommend checking out that if you're interested. So with that, I think we should uh, start uh, this session and uh, we're going to start with Peter then and I will send the rest of you out. So go ahead. Okay, thank you. Yes, uh, so today I'll talk a little bit about the uh, Static and dynamic secrets. So what what is it, and uh, why should we care about them? And also, how are we how are we handling secrets uh, at Luna, and uh, where do we want to go in the future, and, and why? So uh, so first off, uh, let's start with uh, with sort of defining what is a static and a dynamic secret, and then uh, talk a little bit about the concept that we have used to to evaluate our strategy for for handling secrets. Uh, there it is. Okay, so a, a static secret. Think about it like as as a password or an API token. It's something something that we generate, and uh, and we we sort of we are responsible for the life cycle of this secret. So if we need to change it, then we have to do this manually. There's no one else doing it for us. It does. The secret is is valid until we uh, we revoke it ourselves. So so they they don't run out at some point. Um, so in case of a compromise, well, we have to take care of revoking the secret ourselves and sort of uh, making sure that it's not littered around um, the place. On the other hand, we have dynamic secrets. So they are the issue that it's, uh, with the time to live. So that means that they're only valid for this predefined period of time. Uh, and after that time is elapsed, then the secrets are revoked and can't be used anymore. Um, so so the secrets are, un are unique to, to a client. Uh, so when you, re you request a secret when you need it, and when you're done, then the secret uh, is revoked. It runs out. So uh, for example, we can uh, use uh, AWS temporary credentials uh, as an example of this, uh, where you ask for credentials that were valid for say eight, eight hours, you can get them. Uh, and, and when you're done, it, they can't be used anymore. So for dynamic secrets, uh, should they be compromised, uh, or you have an application that leaks these secrets, then you don't have, the, the time frame where they can be used by an adversary, it, it's shortened because they revoked uh, automatically. So the life cycle uh, is handled by, by another entity. You don't have to worry about that. So uh, in many ways, a dynamic secret is, is preferable um, uh, to static secrets, right? So uh, why should we care? Well, uh, as I said before, 
the window of an opportunity uh, for an attacker uh, gets smaller. It will also lighten the work uh, uh, for our developers and uh, internal teams. We don't have to, to make plans for when do we uh, rotate our credentials. Uh, and, and in the case of a, of a breach, we don't have to set time aside to make sure that we rotate everything. Also, since they are issued for a, uh, for a unique client, revoking credentials uh, becomes uh, easier because uh, shared uh, static secrets, well, it's hard to, to invoke it, then everything, uh, then nothing works, right? So really what it gives us is it gives us more control uh, in, the, in the end. Uh, so I want to introduce two other uh, concepts or terms, uh, secrets islands and secret stall. What exactly is this and what are the consequences of this? Well, um, if you look at secret uh, secret silence, well, it's uh, it's when we have different systems handling different types of secrets. So you may have uh, one system that issues uh, for instance for AWS, another for for your Rabbit MQ. Uh, so the consequence of this is that it, it increases the complexity uh, of working with secrets because the APIs are not unified. You you need to know one way to get secrets from. Uh, one place and maybe it's different for another place and how is is access handled uh, in these different uh, in these different islands if you can say that, right, like that so also scaling becomes harder now we introduce a new system then we have to also introduce a system to to handle uh, credentials for this system so we have to, to uh, it, we have to add work on top of that uh, and lastly we have we want to we want to centralize our audience and we have to make sure that each of these islands ships off their logs uh, to our central logging repository to get insights into use uh, uses of these secrets and issue of these so we uh, we at Luna, we want to uh, preferably uh, not have that many islands preferably only one so secret sprawl is the concept of, of copying the same secret around and storing it in different locations and since you're copying secrets well they they are by definition then they have to be static right because copying them around if they are if they are revoked at some time then you have to copy them again so it doesn't make sense to to do that if they're not static. uh the problem with this is that you uh, you get the problem of inventory where are all these keys and credentials where are they stored so you have to sort of make that bookkeeping on the side and that's uh, that, that's extra work you have to do. So that's not something that we want to do. Uh, often. We want to develop our application. We don't want to to sort of have extra systems to make sure that our secrets where they are. That, that should be handled automatically. Also, if you copy the secret, you have the same secret in two places, and it's used by two systems. I mean, who who is doing what, and how can we see which system? We don't have an, we don't have a, a unique identity for our systems. And it's like, it has like the broken window principle uh, in software. You start copying the secrets around and then you say, oh, we it, sure, we covered it to here. Why not cover it over here and over here? And then it sort of sort of crawls out into all corners of your, of your infrastructure. And it becomes harder and harder to deal with over time. So that's also uh, something that we want to avoid. Right. So our main goal at Luna is that we want to avoid uh, sprawl and islands. Uh, so, so what's the what's like what's the state of secrets management at Luna right now? Uh, so we are based on AWS. So we have a lot of AWS resources that our, uh, our services need to access, like S3, DynamoDB, and the list goes on. So we have to to inject secrets for for that into our system. Uh, on top of that, we have some third party integrations. Most of the times, these has these integrations they have to to use static secrets because yeah, they, they only use from, from some some service that talks to this uh, third party and then it makes okay, it's okay to have static secrets here. Um, we have RabbitMQ, uh, user management for that and, and login to, to that. And, and we have uh, SQL databases where we need to, to authenticate and, and VPN and the list goes on. So, so there's always, <laughs> there's often being added new systems because the developing software, right? Uh, we want to handle this. Uh, so right now on Kubernetes, we're using seal secrets and seal secrets, uh, it's, it's, it's great. We can, uh, it's, it's an operator that we uh, deploy into a cluster and it comes with a custom resource definition of a seal secret uh, where uh, 
the developer asks uh, for a public key and locally can, uh, can encrypt the secret and store it in, in Git. And when the time comes where we need the secret and we apply it to a cluster, the operator sees, this is a sealed secret. Uh, I have the private key, so I will unpack it and make it available uh, as a secret inside our cluster. That's pretty much how, how it works. Um, so the the pros, the, the benefits of using sealed secrets is that it's 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 pretty it's really simple. Uh, the command line interface is uh, is integrated with our developer tooling, so no no of our, none of our, our developers need to know anything about keys or encryption methods or anything like that. It just they just ask uh, the the tool to get this uh, secret ready, and and it does that. It outputs the secret, and we can in, put it into into Git. Um, so it fits perfectly into our, our GitOps uh, workflow, uh, and it promotes developer autonomy because the developers can add a secret when it's needed to the repository it's needed. So it, they don't have to go through processes of getting secrets into another system. It's it's in their own hands, uh, which is great, and that's uh, it's it speeds up uh, development. It's not a, a barrier for for our teams. On the other hand, we there are some drawbacks, right? Because you, you create a secret and you commit it to Git, then it's a static secret. It, it can't be anything else, right? So we have static secrets uh, commit. And if you want to change it, you have to create a new pull request, uh, encrypt a new secret, and commit it, and get it applied to the cluster. So, um, and restart our, our pod since it's, it's secrets and they are loaded, the way they're loaded in, well, we have to, to load them from the beginning. Uh, also, if we want a secret in, in more than one namespace, we have to make copies of the secrets. So already here, we're going to go to, to copy uh, the secret around. It's inside the cluster, but still, uh, unless we want it uh, for the whole cluster, then you can can tell the sealed secret to to make uh, it has it can be available for the whole cluster. And another thing you have to be careful about is uh, since the operator works uh, on a private key that's stored inside the cluster. Uh, you have to to uh, to take care of your of your uh, access control for this resource. So if because if anyone get ac gets access to this uh, private key, well, uh, it's game over. Uh, so that's great for for everything inside Kubernetes. But it, it works. It, it does what we want it to do. Uh, aside from it being static, but we also have uh, stuff running outside of Kubernetes, like the Lambda function. So we have might have VPN keys or or a CI system that we sell secrets. So, so we set out to, to sort of find out what are the requirements in Luna for a secrets management solution? Uh, because uh, we know we need to change this as we grow. Uh, we need better controls, but still ensure that we're not uh, a roadblock due to, to in implementing processes and gates for our develop uh, developer teams. So we, uh, we set up some requirements, and one of them is, of course, we need uh, we need secrets to be accessible from, from anywhere. So, sort of a unified way of uh, getting access to these secrets. Right? Uh, it should not be be different from from if you're in Kubernetes or in a Lambda function. There should be one go-to uh, way of doing it. Uh, also, th this when development teams know that this is the way we handle secrets, they they won't come up with anything new, which should be pretty easy. Uh, and the next requirement, we want uh, authentication agility. And what I mean by agility here is that we want to be able to handle authentication from multiple uh, uh, multiple sources, like IAM or Kubernetes or, or G Suite or Okta or something like that. Uh, so, so that's important. We don't want to distribute a, an API token to everything so they can, uh, they can uh, authenticate to, to, our, uh, to our secrets management system. And of course, we will favor dynamic uh, credentials, temporary credentials, when possible. Sometimes it's not possible, and that's that's okay. But but if the, it is, uh, then we want to use it because of the benefits uh, that I described earlier uh, that they give us. We must still support static secrets because yeah, third party uh, uh, integrations uh, we have to support that. So, and last but not least, we we ha we want audit blocks, and we we want to couple that with the dynamic credentials so we get insights into who is doing what, uh, when, and make sure that audit logs are always provided for our access to secrets and usage. Um, so what are our options? We've looked at, at different uh, options. One is to use uh, 
take just one problem at a time, solve it. Access to AWS resources. Well, use uh, IAM modes for service accounts. Uh, then for Postgres uh, SQL database, we create an operating. We create another operating. But over time, this won't scale. And we get this is sort of this is secret islands that I was talking about. So now we have a lot of secret islands, and, and we get we still get the dynamic credentials, but we have to 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 take care of a new system every time. So we want something else. And uh, what we have been looking at is, what Henrik put uh, a bit later, is HashiCorp Vault, because it unifies the access uh, to, to secrets into one place. We centralize our secrets. Um, so it's the same way you get secrets from everywhere. Also, it provides a lot of different different options for authentication. And the same goes for secrets engines. So we can get uh, create secrets, dynamic secrets, for, for a lot of different systems. We get that out of the box. Uh, centralized audit log which was a requirement, and also revocation, because it's, it, all secrets are centralized, and we have insights into who has uh, requested uh, credentials for these systems. And on top of that, uh, we also get uh, the possibility to create plugins. If Vault doesn't uh, support this, we can create a plugin uh, that creates credentials and revokes it, and Vault take care, takes care of everything else around it, like logging and revocation and, and life, life cycling. Um, oh, and, and one more uh, point is that uh, it uh, Vault also gives us uh, cryptography as a service. It's something that we haven't talked about, but we can use it to more than just uh, secrets. So that's sort of the state of uh, secrets uh, management in Luna and what we're working at right now. Um, so uh, if you guys have any questions, feel free to, to ask and uh, thank you for listening. Thank you so much for the presentation. It was great gaining insights on what you're looking at and, and what is important for you to get to work the way you needed to. So uh, I'm checking right now. If you have any questions uh, to Peter around this, then feel free to send it, send it in the chat. I think I should be able to get it. I'm also checking all the channels. Uh, so we'll just wait a couple like a couple minutes to see what's going on here, uh, if we get any questions coming in. And I will add the other speakers on as well in case they have any follow-up questions. Hello, welcome. Hi, thank you. Was there anything you wanted to ask uh, Peter around it? I'll check the channels. It was a great talk. Thank you. Cool. I think we will uh, check back later on and see if we get any questions at the end of the presentation. Thank you so sure. much for your presentation. And okay. uh, next up is going to be uh, Hannah. And I'm yes. And can you share your slides? Ah, oh, of course. Let's see. So next up is Hannah, and she's going to talk about external secrets. And here we go. Hi, everyone. In this presentation, I will tell you about external secrets, why we chose this specific secret manager and how it fits in our workflow at Anotel. So then, who am I who will do this presentation? My name is Hannah Streng, and I work as platform engineer at Anotel in Gothenburg, Sweden. And I think this will be really fun to share Anotel's knowledge about external secrets, which is quite newly implemented in our workflow. So when I said newly implemented in our workflow, I meant that up until recently, we had no secret manager. All our secrets were stored in Kubernetes and it worked fine. But we knew that if something happened with our Kubernetes cluster, all secrets would be lost. And this was something that we had to solve. So here we saw two solutions, either do backups or have a secret manager. And as this presentation already have revealed to you, we chose a secret manager. But before we chose which secret manager we wanted to use, we had a list of things that had to work. So what we were looking for was, of course, a secret manager that in an easy way could restore our secrets if something unforeseen would happen. 
We work in Google Cloud Platform connected with Kubernetes, and the secret manager must have support for these. The teams are themselves responsible for creating and updating the secrets, and therefore it needs to be simple to use. We use Argo CD and have a GitOps workflow. And not to forget is our already existing secrets in Kubernetes that we wanted to migrate to the secret manager. And this migration, we wanted to be as simple as possible. So if we had this type of wish list, what was the reason for us to choose external secrets? And how did we know when to stop looking for another, maybe a better secret manager? When we read and tried out external secrets, we found out that external secrets provided us with the features we wanted and also wanted to have. All our previously presented points in the checklist were fulfilled. But as a positive complement, we also learned that it was possible to create and update the secrets both via terminal and console. The teams could then choose what they prefer to use. We could track the secrets in Git without exposing any secret values. And the external secrets can by itself keep track of what, what version of the secret that is the latest version to use. So you don't need to know that yourself. Okay, so now I have only mentioned a lot of points in a checklist uh, that we had from the beginning. So how do we actually use this at Anatel? And how has our workflow changed? First, it took a very little effort to start using external secrets. You need a custom resource definition for external secret objects and a deployment responsible for syncing between Google Secret Manager and the Kubernetes cluster. And when you then have that in place, external secrets connects all these parts, our Google Cloud Platform, Kubernetes, and the deployments. As I have mentioned, we had no Secret Manager before. So what we did when creating secrets were by manually creating them through the terminal in Kubernetes. And this command translated to a file would look something like this. But now when we have external secrets, we no longer need to create a secret object in Kubernetes. Instead, it happens automatically through external secrets. And the YAML file that we now create with our secrets for deployments looks like this one. This file you need for external secrets to know what secret to look for in Google Secret Manager, and then what secret to create in Kubernetes, which our deployments then finds. So if we look at the two different secret YAML files that just been presented, the one we write today, and the old one from our past setup. A difference you may be noticing, besides that there are a few more lines in our external secret YAML file, is that in this file, only our names of the secrets are exposed. You can't see any secret values as you get in the old secret YAML on the right hand side. This makes it possible for us to push the external secret YAML to Git, and we can collect all files connected to our deployment in one place. And since we now can save the secrets in one file in Git, we can collect it in the same customized file to deploy together with our deployment, which works great in our Argo CD and GitOps workflow. As before, we still today need to create the secret manually. This is done either by terminal, like the example command given here, or directly in the Google Cloud Platform. It doesn't matter what way you choose, the secret will be created and stored in Google Secret Manager either way. 
So as I mentioned in the previous slide, the external secret YAML file is functioning as a guidance for external secret to know what secret to look for in Google Secret Manager to then create the secret in Kubernetes. This means that the secret must be created in Google Cloud Platform before the YAML files are applied. Otherwise, the secrets won't be available in Kubernetes for the deployments defined. So now as a small summarize, I have collected some good parts and difficulties we found with external secrets uh, and that I've done as a pros and cons list. So if we start with the cons, uh, the list is quite short. The documentation about external secrets was partly unstructured uh, when you had another cloud platform than Amazon's cloud platform. At least that is what we thought when reading the parts for Google Cloud. You had to jump back and forth in the text to be able to understand the context and uh, how to install it. And lastly, we still haven't got rid of the manual step of creating a secret. We still have to create the secret by hand. And then to the list of pros. Uh, we have mentioned all these before, but it was easy to connect everything to external secrets and make it work. External secrets works great with Argo CD and our GitOps workflow. We can store our secrets in Git without revealing any key values and can store all our files connected to a deployment in the same place. It is easy for all teams to create and upgrade secrets by themselves, either by terminal or console. And uh, before we had a secret manager, we had secrets already running in Kubernetes. And these we could migrate seamlessly. I don't have the time here to explain how the migration is done. You just have to take my word for it. But in short, I can tell you that we didn't have to delete any already existing secrets running in Kubernetes, just adding them to the Google Secret Manager, create an, ex an external secret YAML, and the deployments could be left unchanged. And of course, last but not least, all secrets are now restorable which was the main reason for us to change from our previous workflow of how to create secrets. So that is a pretty important point. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you for the presentation. It was great to hear. Thank you. Uh, I would be lying if I said it was the first time I heard it since me and Hannah works together. Uh, but uh, <laughs> thank you anyway for sharing that. And let's see if we have any questions for Hannah. I think we have a comment coming. Uh, so let's add Peter Henrik back to the stream. Welcome back. Uh, any questions from uh, from the other speakers around this? I've I've never tried the Google secret thingy. Um, how does it? Uh, how do you separate uh, secrets for, for instance, uh, different environments? Does it have like namespace uh, or something, or what does it do? Uh, yes, in the external secret. Uh, YAML, um, maybe I can show you, Let's see, uh, here, you you say what namespace and you also save it in the correct namespace when you apply it. Uh, so it's separated by namespace uh, through that. So you save it to the, to the, uh, the namespace that the deployment is running in. That that's it. Kubernetes. How do you separate it in in the Google uh, secret thing? In the in the Google, you don't have to separate it. It okay. uh, works fine or, as it or is. Can't. It's, uh, or can't. I would say. Oh, oh yeah, because... yeah. <laughs> you can't you can't separate into namespaces. So in the YAML file, it's only the place to do namespaces. So uh, you came up with a naming convention, right, Hannah? for how to name the secrets in, in Google Cloud uh, to separate them from like staging and production. And uh, now I'm not following. Uh, where you put like, so since you can't uh, separate them inside Google Secret Manager, 
between each other, there is a long list of secrets. You have to like name them this application, this type of secret in this environment or something like that. So you get like pretty yeah, long exactly. names. Yeah, uh, we have in our guidelines that it's a good idea to start with the namespace that the circuit is actually uh, used in and then a dash and then the deployment and then dash uh, what team. So you can see it uh, in Google Secret Manager. Otherwise it can be difficult or you can use like labels. Uh, you can have, we also have labels that you uh, say namespace and then what namespace the secret is used in. And that you can see in Google Secret Manager. Cool. Uh, I think we have a question incoming. Uh, it does seem that uh, external secret still creates a normal secret for holding a value it fetches from the external source. Is that value secured in any way, or is it still just base64 encoded? Um, it's secure in that way that it's uh, only uh, you can only see it in Google uh, Secret Manager. So that's where you put it. Um, so it's more than just base64 uh, encoded, um, I would say. Well, isn't it also a little bit like inside the cluster, you have a resource that is a secret. And that secret should be protected uh, using a uh, RBAC or something like that. So, so that way it should go. Yeah, it's still basically the uh, oops. Oh. Uh, I think she's coming back. Uh, that was probably an accidental click. Uh, it, it is still the secret object. Here we go. Hi. Hi. <laughs> something happened. <laughs> The wrong window. <laughs> uh, OK, so uh, I think we have another question uh, around the uh, dynamic uh, secrets. Uh, Peter, if you are up for that now. Uh, yes, do you set alerts for dynamic secrets expiration or rather long-lived secrets or credentials? Uh, alerts. So as we haven't implemented it yet, uh, it is something that the application should should uh, should handle. Uh, I believe that when when they ask for new credentials, they get them, and when there's a lease on those credentials that they can renew, uh, and if they expire, then they have to fetch new ones. Uh, so alerting shouldn't be uh, an issue. So they should just handle that seamlessly. Cool. Thank you. Uh, we have another question around uh, the extended secrets, I think. Uh, is it possible to use KMS keyring to generate key secrets and manage the rotations, the rotations with this approach? Is that something you look into, Hannah, during this period? No, sorry. Um, that's nothing that we have uh, looked at um, so that I don't have any information about. Cool, thank you. Uh, then I think we are pausing questions right now. Uh, thank you. We keep them coming and we will see if we can get back to them later after the next presentation. But uh, we are going to move on with Henrik's presentation. So I will send the rest of you out. Thank you for now. And Henrik, you are welcome. Go. Yeah, thank you. Um, so it's no secret that I like Walt. Um, and in this talk, I'll talk about some of the experience I have with Walt, uh, working for various customers. Uh, I work as a consultant. Um, so this is me with a picture, and I even have a beard at that point as well. Um, so I work with cloud native scaling organization. I think that's really interesting as well. I have a Twitter and uh, a LinkedIn, and I even have an email. So if you have questions or want to reach out, let me know. So, dun, 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 the Batman theme. Um, I'm going to talk slightly about uh, some of the ways I think HashiCorp Vault is awesome. That's why I'll talk slightly about Kubernetes, um, and then, of course, about Vault. And Vault is made by HashiCorp. And I know what you're thinking when you see the HashiCorp logo, and I need to stop you right there. 
it's not from the movie Robocop. They have a completely different logo. They're called OCP. It looked nothing. Okay, it looks slightly bad, like the logo, but it's not that. Okay, so move on, right? Um, so what we needed from a secret manager, we needed something that could take care of the life cycle of our secrets. So create, upgrade, delete, rotate, whatever that might be. We needed somewhere to store them, to uh, have them living, right? And where did we do that? How do we pass it on to the environment or the pot, or whatever need to use it without exposing them? And how do we get access to these secrets? And how do we manage that access? And for that, we have in many uh, cases, we chosen Vault because it's open source and you can deploy it basically everywhere where you want to. Um, so you're not locked into AWS secrets, whatever they call it, or Asia or Azure or whatever. Um, the great thing about it is that it integrates with Kubernetes. So for instance, if you have a pod that tries to authenticate uh, to, uh, to Vault, it can do it with the service account from Kubernetes. So the way that Vault um, knows that the pod is the pod that it's uh, pod tending to be, uh, pod intended, uh, it can actually ask the API server and then say, yes, this is the correct uh, service account. And then it'll give back a client token. And then that client token is tied to a policy in Vault. And that gives you access to some parts of the system. Uh, it can also do some username, password login for humans, if you have those uh, around. Um, and it does have a UI uh, vault, and you can use tokens and all sorts of stuff. And we we really like vault. I really like vault. Um, you can read more about the Kubernetes inter integration there. I did a workshop in Oslo uh, some years ago about this. I think it's still online somewhere. Um, and to elaborate on uh, Peter's talk, um, it does integrate with both um, RapidMQ and Postgres and a lot of other systems where it actually has, it, it basically a middle broker or something. So Vault has super access user to these systems. And then when a, a service needs access, it'll actually contact Vault and say, hey, could you be a good friend and give me access? And then it'll create an account in RabbitMQ or in Postgres and give that back to the service. And then it'll have a TTL of time to live. Um, that way, you don't really store secrets. You have a mechanism instead, and it's dynamic. It's new secrets all the time. So you have to be really a pro gamer to hack this thing. Um, there are some good videos on YouTube. Um, I could also phrase it as I found two videos. Um, one is about the Postgres integration and the other one is about the RapidMQ. They do have other integration as well, uh, also with AWS and a lot of stuff. But the story I'm going to talk about today is where we can't do this. Um, so we worked for a customer in an air-capped environment. And if you haven't seen this movie, the joke isn't really worth a lot. Uh, it's from Back to the Future, remember, <laughs> right? Okay. So what we needed was we needed to set up an environment at a remote location um, and have secrets. And not just secrets, they're really paranoid, so they wanted to store every configuration information in Vault. So basically what we did was, and I say we, it's basically Jonas Winder, my colleague, um, we created a small tool called Medusa. Um, the company didn't use Medusa. They used another one with another Greek mythology name, uh, but this is the open source. Um, so basically, Walt has an API, and that's really awesome because then you can actually interact with it. So Jonas made a Golang application, a CLI, where you can uh, export data, and you can actually encrypt it at rest or at disk or, you know, so you can get it as YAML or JSON, depending on what you're into. And then it can encrypt it so that when it hits disk, uh, it will be encrypted. 
And because of recent development in technologies around the save icon, you can put it on a disk. And uh, this is really awesome. And you can actually eject these from the computer. Because you're probably thinking, how do I get it to a site that has no internet, right? But you can actually put it on a medium like the save icon and then move it to the site. And then you put it in the back of the truck. If you're an American, it's probably an F-150. And you can then travel to an air-gapped environment. And I don't know what a environment that doesn't have internet looked like, but this is what I presume it looks like. Um, and then when you get there, you can basically do the exact opposite, right? So you feed the YAML or the JSON to Medusa, and you can then, it'll then uh, decrypt it with the key that you give it separately in another car. And then it'll actually import it to Walt. And the great thing is that you can actually take a subsection of the tree, if you want, inside Walt, both in the import and the export part. Um, so with that, I would like to do, go to the, the, not the zoo, but the demo. So I have a small demo here. So if we go to scripts, see that I had I made a small script that can start up a vault uh, container and it creates some keys because I like HTTPS and stuff and it, it does a lot of great stuff for me. So now that's done. Then if we go back to this one, we can go to, oh, sorry, this was the save icon I was looking at. Uh, let's go here, localhost here. I use self-signed certificates, that's how I roll. And we go to Walt, and I have a document on a screen you can't see where I have a secret token, and then I log in. And this is what Walt looks like. So if we want to import data, we can run Medusa and then import, and then secret, and then we can do, I'll just copy paste again. We have this one file where we import it. So now if we go back to Walt, inside secrets, we can see we have dev and production, we have users and so on and so on. And then to do the opposite part, we can do a Medusa export secret slash, then we could do like take a subsection of it, then just get from the users and onwards, and then we have that. So we only have that, right? And then you can pipe that to a disk. And if you give it some parameters, it'll also uh, encrypt it. Um, so that's what we did for one of the customers where they needed all this data on site. And we should then be able to update this. And that would be with uh, something like Medusa. And I think it works quite well. Um, and we really like how we could use Walt and the API um, to do this. And um, that was my story. Um, so let's see if we go here. Yeah. So that was the demo. Uh, there are some other, th so if you want to know more about Walt, the policies, uh, so this is basically what defines what you have access to, and then you can create some tokens. And you can also do a, so when you install Walt, it will be sealed and you need to unseal it. And then something called auto unseal that you can set up. We made some of our own stuff for this customer because it was uh, air gapped. And um, yeah, it works quite nice. Um, I am almost done. I think I'm done here. So I might not have used all my time. Uh, I hope that's okay. Uh, but uh, this was That's uh, definitely this was okay for me. Thank, Thank you. you for sharing. Thank you for a great presentation. So, and by uh, the way, we, a, yeah, yeah uh, sorry, a, a pro gamer tip if you buy a save icon, you should look for this HD icon up here. That's the good stuff. <laughs> it's good stuff. Thank you so much. Uh, and if you have any questions to Henrik, be free to write them in the chat. Uh, I'm also going to add back the other uh, speakers to the stream again. Uh, welcome back. Uh, any questions to Henrik from, from the rest of you? Um, so 
this is different from just taking a backup of your vault and transporting it to another location, uh, right? Since it's only yeah. the secret server. Yeah, me. so the, the problem with vault is that if you want to get something from vault, you can get like a key value and you cannot get this, you know, everything underneath it, you can get this one thing. So you need to keep asking it. So we basically just wrapped the API with some recursive stuff. Um, because that, that's what we missed from Walt, basically. Um, but yeah, I, I would say you should always do the dynamic part if you can. This is because it was air gapped. So I wanted to tell that story because it's it's like, it's an island, let's call it that, a uh, yeah. secret island. Um, but I really like this integration with RabbitMQ and uh, Postgres and so on, where it can actually create it dynamically whenever you need it. Um, because then you don't need to store them. You just need to have your service account and authenticate to Walt and say, hey, this is me, believe it or not. And then you get a, a client token back. Yeah. Cool. Uh, so I'm looking and we have no uh, new questions incoming here. Uh, so yeah, I think maybe then this is a wrap actually. Uh, thank you all for coming here and presenting today. And thank you for sharing your stories and how you're doing. And uh, thanks so much for taking the time. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Cool. Then uh, we're taking a break for the summer and we hope to see everyone back in the fall. If you have a great topic in mind for what you would like to see in the next uh, next session in the Canada Nordics, then let us know. And if you are interested in speaking, then feel free to reach out as well. And while I'm talking, we're getting some questions coming in. Are you free to hang around for and answer some questions uh, that's coming in? Sure. Cool. Yeah. Uh, so we have one from Eve. Uh, the drawback of uh, Walt, I can see, is the maintenance. What do you see? I think this is to Hendrik then. Yeah, I, I don't want to be the soon to be partner with HashiCorp that tells you that you can buy the cloud version, of course. So yes, you need to maintain it and you need to install it. You can get it up and running in HA, so have multiple multiple instances running. I was looking for a good word. Uh, you can use uh, different backends like a console, for instance. Um, you can have it on a disk, uh, not if you're doing HA, but... Um, so yeah, there are some options there. I think there's an operator. I know that uh, Corios or Corvus or whatever they were called, they did an operator and then it went away and I think someone else did something. Um, but it's it's really, it's quite easy to install. The, I think the, the one of the things I like about the HashiCorp products or, or projects is that they're really easy. It's like, I mean, three lines of configuration if you do it manually. Uh, I mean, if you go and look at the parameters for the kubelet, it's slightly more than three parameters, right? It's super easy, so, yeah. Okay, no really big concern about meeting Walter um, from the soon-to-be partner of uh, So, uh, we have another question coming in. Uh, do you see any issues with Walt being a runtime dependency for your applications when using dynamic secrets? Yes. <laughs> um, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, you depend on Walt. I mean, you need. I mean, you depend on something always. And and in this case, you are basically centralizing your secret management in an application. And of course, it needs to be up and running. So I would always run it as uh, HA. Have like two thousand of them running or something. I don't know, three or five or something. Right. Um, yeah. So. It is, a, it is a risk. Peter, anything to add there? No, I, I completely agree. Uh, you should run it in a high availability setup, uh, of course. Because uh, nothing works if you can't get your credentials right. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Cool. And then we have one question that I think is uh, applying for everyone here. Uh, so let's do a round table. Uh, what are the reactions from the developers regarding secret management in development environment, in testing environment, et cetera? So let's do it in the order of this uh, talks. Peter, would you like to start giving an answer to that? Yeah, so, well, our developers just want something that's easy. So they don't really care. It's my my understanding, at least, that they don't really care which secrets manager we use. 
Uh, they just want to be able to, to provide the, the services with the secrets they need. Uh, the easier it is, the better. It's, it's, it's that simple. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Sorry, we didn't mean to cut you off. Oh, it was just re regarding environments, uh, in development environments, they, we don't uh, enforce uh, stuff to be encrypted. We use dummy values and stuff. It's, it's to keep it uh, simple for, for developers. It's about, about development speed in the end. And uh, yeah, we have to keep the last year. Thank you. Hannah. Um, it's mostly the same. Uh, we also want it to be simple. Uh, the developers don't want it to be difficult to, to, cre to create secrets because then it takes time and it's just messy, uh, everything. So we want it to be simple. And if it's not simple, then we have to help. And it's, so if we find something more easy, then we save everybody's time. So uh, that's the reaction uh, from the developers. Um, we need something simple to use. Henrik, what do you say? I have a background as a system administrator, so I'll try and put my system administrator people skills into work here. Um, <laughs> I don't think developers like security. It's always in the way. So the easier you can do it, the better. Um, I think everyone who've read the DevOps handbook and uh, the Phoenix project and all that knows that uh, security shouldn't stop things. We should monitor it and we should make it better. Um, I, I, I like the fact that, you know, with Walt and probably also other products, you, you can actually remove it. Uh, of course, your application needs to be able to talk to Walt and be able to handle uh, whether it can, whether the time to live has expired or, you know, you need to get a new one, and stuff like that. But I think if you create your software in, uh, in a component way, you, it's just a component that you add in, the, in your application or service. Um, so hopefully we can make security disappear and just make it a great experience for developers. <laughs> Sorry for the drama. Thank you. <laughs> the drama. But yeah, I, I think I agree from my experience as well that uh, the more easy you can make it to be secure, the, the more likely it is that developer do something secure as well. It has to be approachable. It has to be easy to use. Or I would should say simple to use and simple to maintain over time. That's the keywords. We have one more question here uh, from Eve. Uh, Functionality-wise, Walt offers more than AWS KMS. I uh, question mark. I think it is the question if Walt offers more than AWS KMS. Um, anyone with experience enough to compare them? Without knowing anything about AWS, I would uh, KMS. I would say yes. You can run it other places. Yeah, that's a good point. So it, it's a different vendor looking at least than AWS KMS. Yes. Cool. Uh, I think actually this will have to be it. Uh, we got a lot of questions. Thank you all who sent us questions and thank you all for taking the time to uh, do a presentation here today. And thank you for joining. Uh, have a wonderful summer and see you back in the fall. Bye everyone. Right. Bye -bye.